Patrol gas platform is the largest object ever moved by man across the surface of the Earth. But deep in its engineering DNA are connections to some surprising ancestors. You see, this immense structure just wouldn't be possible if it weren't for a highly unusual family tree that includes a grain elevator, an air pump, a racing car, a failed suspension bridge, and the nature of a single musical note. How do these connect with one of the tallest structures in the Seven Seas? I'm on a journey to reveal the engineering triumphs embedded in the tallest concrete structure in the Seven Seas, the Trolley Gas Platform. Located 70 kilometers off Norway in the stormy North Sea, it's not immediately apparent how big the Trolley is. This structure is so enormous, it's hard to get your head round. And most of it is underwater. Standing here is the equivalent of being on top of the Empire State Building, with the sea coming up to the 80th floor. Even on dry land, building the half-kilometre-high platform would have been daunting for any engineer. But Troll has to withstand one of the most hostile marine environments on the planet. Troll's legs will take a battering during their life. If you want to get up close and personal with them, there's only one way. Getting down to sea level 60 meters below. I've never flown on a boat before. Luckily, the weather today is kind. They can't even launch the boat if the waves are over three meters high. Troll can expect to be hit by waves 30 meters high, right up to the base of the platform. These legs will have to keep Troll standing till 2066. They've got to be strong, but amazingly, they've also got to be flexible to bend to the force of the waves. Building them called for a special kind of concrete. The concrete used to build it has its roots in a garden with a man whose only desire was to find a decent plant pot. Today, concrete is the most widely used man-made material in the world, and it's been around for a long time. The Romans used it almost 2,000 years ago. But the Roman version would not have been good enough for the troll. It wouldn't bend. For the story of how flexible concrete was created, fast forward from ancient Rome to the Palace of Versailles in 19th century France. Gardener Joseph Monnier builds big, strong concrete pots to plant trees in. Only there's a hitch. Trees grow and expand, but concrete is rigid. Monnier needed to create concrete that could stand up to the power of plants. I've come to meet engineer Gareth Hughes to find out how he did it. Gareth. Probably the best way then to understand what concrete is, is to make some, so I brought a wheelbarrow and a shovel. So what's in it? The basic ratio would be three coarse aggregate, two sand and one shovel of cement. That's what gives it its strength. Finally, you need water to bind it all together. That's basic concrete. So what's wrong with it? I mean, it is immensely strong, surely. It is strong. But only in certain applications. For example, if someone's to squash it or put it under compression, 
then it's very strong, it'll resist that force for quite a while. But if it was to have something that was going to be in the middle, say, a heavy load in the centre of it, it could bend it, put it in tension. And it's not very strong under those circumstances, it's quite brittle and it'd probably snap. So like any material then, it can be very strong in one way. In this instance, you can't squash it. Yeah. But if you try and bend it, that's its weakness. And that's the problem with ordinary concrete. The concrete in the trough needs to be able to give to withstand the constant pounding from big waves. Gareth wants to show what would happen if it were built of ordinary concrete. First, we have to build our own concrete test lab. We know ordinary concrete is very strong if you try to compress or squeeze it. We're going to see whether it will bend. In other words, what tension does to it. Gareth has prepared a huge slab of concrete. 20 centimetres thick and weighing nearly five tonnes. You'd think this would be incredibly strong. Let's see. I'm going to drop a small 32 kilogram weight, just three metres, the equivalent of a four metre wave hitting the trolley platform. Surely, if the troll were made of something like this, it would stand secure. You would have thought concrete of that thickness would be pretty strong. I know I did. And it is. It's just that it's only strong in certain ways. It does have weaknesses. I can't believe that broke it. And this was Joseph Monnier's problem back in 19th century France. He found the pots cracked as the tree roots grew and expanded. Monnier's solution was to add a reinforcing material that could bend and stretch and make up for the shortcomings of concrete. In his day, he used iron. Today, we use steel, but it's exactly the same theory. And it's beautifully simple to make. Just pour concrete around a steel frame. Reinforcement lets the concrete bend, and concrete protects the steel from the elements. This slab is the exact same size as the one we just broke. It's still 20 centimeters thick. The only difference is that it's been reinforced with 26 steel rods. To test it, we're not going to mess around with the kind of weight I can lift. That's the slab that broke. That should weigh a bit. Whilst we can't drop a five-ton skin, this will be 50 times the load of the earlier test. But will some thin rods of reinforcing steel really stop this slab from breaking? Technically, this should work. Could have. It's holding for now. The only difference between that slab and the one that broke are those few bits of reinforcing steel. This is the gauge of steel that they use to reinforce that slab. And this is the gauge of steel they use to reinforce the concrete on the trolley platform. That's got to be tough. As Monnier found, you don't need much steel to make it effective. But because troll is so huge, there's still enough steel for 15 Eiffel Towers. The rest of the structure consists of relatively cheap concrete, enough to build two and a half Wembley stadiums. Not even the biggest waves can threaten Troll now. But the rig also needs to be watertight. Again, it was the 19th century that provided the solution, by way of American farming. 
The hollow troll gas platform extends all the way to the seabed, nearly a third of a kilometer below the waves. With two thirds of the structure underwater, engineers needed to ensure the stormy seas stayed on the outside of the troll. Yep, that is quite a drop. And uh, if the view isn't enough to tell you all you need to know about how big these legs actually are, the fact that it's a nine minute elevator ride to get down to the bottom might be the job. I mean, nine minutes. Oh, well it, it's meant to do that. It always does. Nine minutes of this to get to the bottom. How far is it? The elevator travels down inside one of the troll's legs, right down to the seabed. I'm at the bottom of one of Trolley's legs, which puts me very deep indeed. That ceiling that I can see, way up there, isn't the top of the leg. In fact, that's barely a third of the way up. It's nearly three times further than that to the top. And that puts me on a level with the seabed. And the incredible water pressure down here doesn't just mean that these walls have to be immensely strong. They've also got to be watertight. The external pressure is around 35 kilos per square centimetre at the base of the platform over 300 metres below the waves. And even this two metre thick concrete could fail catastrophically if there were any weaknesses. Incredibly, it's the same problem that confronted American farmers in the Midwest more than a century ago. They needed strong watertight structures as well to store the mountains of grain produced across the Great Plains. Huge grain elevators were constructed of wood. But highly flammable grain dust and wood were a lethal mix, as regular fires proved. They needed an alternative. In 1899, engineers in Minnesota created a revolution with concrete. Their pioneering technique was making concrete waterproof by avoiding joints or seams. Like the grain elevators, if engineers had constructed troll with joints in the concrete, it would have been fatal. So the question is, how do you make a huge concrete structure in the middle of the sea watertight? I pose the dilemma to Grant Schlereth, an engineer who knows all about structural failure. Concrete inherently is a flawless airtight material. What's important to know is that with any structure, if you have a small flaw, it can cause big problems. How small a flaw? very small. Take this, a piece of plastic. It's uh, bendable right now, it's not breaking. You can give it a try. Right, yeah, it's bendy. No flaws. No. Now if we add a, a flaw, just a small little cut. Well, that's it. That's it, do the same thing, give it a try. Look at that. <laughs> and that was a, that's enough. You can't have any flaws, it can cause big problems. Grant and his colleagues devise a test to show what might happen to trolls' legs if they had a small floor. Firstly, they put a seam in a large plastic container and then reseal it. Then they fill the container with water and apply some pressure, explosive pressure.
everything is in place, one very, very slightly flawed water tank. System armed, it's live. Three, two, one. Wow. It went bang. Wow. Let's have a look. So what are we looking for, where and why? Well, you observe that there's a large gash yes, in the structure. It's broken. The flaw that we manufactured, we exposed it to a large force and we see failure. So that small flaw, that join, has compromised the entire structure. That's right. And this could happen as well in a concrete structure, any type of structure really. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Judging by that, just a small weakness in the concrete would be lethal for the troll. But Grant also wants to show me the solution. Simply avoid defects or weaknesses. So, round two. Will the exact same plastic stand the same pressure if it doesn't have a seam? System armed, it's live. Three, two, one. Did it sustain damage? Did it make it? Let's go see. Looks to be intact. I think you're right. It survived it. It did survive. And this is same conditions, same amount of water, same charge. Exactly same material, same. yeah. The only difference is that there's no manufactured seam or a, a join, as we were calling it. And that was our floor, but our floor was where it was joined together. Yeah. And that's the same of concrete as it is of this plastic. That's right, the same principle. There's no flaw, minimizing the chance for damage on a catastrophic scale. Flaws, or seams, are lines of weakness. But how did the troll engineers make a 300 metre high slab of concrete without a single seam? The secret is to build without ever stopping. 24-7 rain or shine. I wanted to get up close to another concrete structure that's been built using the same technique to see how it's done. This time it's a power station in Britain. Unfortunately, it means doing something I hate. I have to travel 180 meters up into the air in a small steel cage. You're quite comfortable here, aren't you? Yeah. You're really not at all bothered, are you? Not really, no. Good. We're not even halfway up yet. Good. Good. I know it looks high from, from down there. From right alongside it, it's, it's very, very high. I have to keep reminding myself that this 180 meter chimney is less than half the height of the trolley. but they use the exact same technique to build it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Just, just a day in the office, all perfectly normal. Yeah. Even when half paralyzed by fear, there's a bit of my mind that is still amazed. This is one lump of concrete. It's one piece. That is just one piece. And it's all thanks to a pioneering waterproof grain elevator in Minnesota, the brainchild of engineer C.F. Haglin. C.F. Haglin realised that if a building is constructed in lots of different sections, it's very difficult to make it waterproof where the sections are joined together. But he found a way to make a building in a single piece, totally waterproof with no leaks or gaps. It's amazing, but even a brief pause in construction would leave a seam. It could be a lethal weakness on the troll. And the secret of building tall structures without ever stopping is to pour the concrete continuously. 
you need a mould that moves up the building as it grows. It's a cycle. Concrete is poured, then hydraulics anchored in the concrete structure itself raise the mould or shutter a few centimetres so that the pouring can start all over again. I'm underneath the rig. This is the shutter that contains the concrete that's being poured. It's a bit that they lift up. This is the fresh concrete that's been exposed underneath. In fact, we're moving now. Look, there you go. That's me, everything I'm standing on, everybody on top. We're all moving up to expose fresh concrete underneath. The process is called slip forming. Hydraulics move the mould up the building without any scaffolding. It's still, it's still wet. It's still, that's not set yet. But it is amazing to think that they're still working above here. They're pouring new concrete at the moment. This is all just wet stuff that's just been poured in from the wheelbarrows. It's just so it's going off here, still soft. And down here, as the chemical reaction is taking place by which the concrete cures, it's warm. This building grows by 20 centimetres an hour. It took six weeks to build the 180 metre chimney. Slip forming is the quickest way of building huge concrete structures. But even with ultra fast slip forming, it still took almost a year to build the troll's mighty legs. Seamless concrete meant the platform could resist the crushing pressures of the sea depths. But the troll still faces an unseen danger hidden in its very structure. The troll gas platform was built to withstand the huge stresses generated by 30 meter waves and gale force winds. But it faces another kind of stress that could be equally devastating. Something as simple as a musical note threatens potential catastrophe. It all starts with every structural engineer's nightmare. The collapse of the mighty Tacoma Narrows Bridge in the USA. The suspension bridge in Washington State was designed to be a revolutionary construction. Engineers use massive 43 centimeter steel cables to carry the concrete rolling. On July 1st, 1940, they celebrated the completion of the third biggest suspension bridge in the world, with a central span 850 meters wide. But local residents noticed the bridge had a quirk. Even moderate winds caused it to bounce up and down. They got used to cars disappearing from sight as the bridge rose and fell, and nicknamed it Galloping Gertie. But then, four months after it opened, Stunned onlookers saw the rigid steel and concrete twisting like rubber. As the edges rose and fell up to eight and a half meters, a confident project engineer strode onto the bridge believing it was still safe. But the twisting got more and more violent. Remarkably, the structure survived the extreme stresses for almost an hour before they became overwhelming. Amazingly, the only fatality was a dog. The problem was caused by a phenomenon called resonance. The trolleys engineers faced an equally dangerous threat. When it's subjected to the wrong kind of stresses, even super strong concrete can fall apart. And because it's located out here in the hostile North Sea, the trolley platform is vulnerable to a particular kind of stress that's repeated over and over again. Waves. Over 70 years, the platform could be hit by more than 180 million waves. I've done the math. 
But it's not the size of the waves that could spell disaster. It's their rhythm. I've discovered the troll is a kind of huge musical instrument, which makes it peculiarly vulnerable to repeated stresses, like lapping waves. I'm here with sound engineer Jonathan Hargreaves to find out trolls' hidden danger. All physical structures have a particular note they like to resonate at, that they will ring at. With the wine glass, that's particularly audible. And if I just ping it, the vibration of the glass vibrates the air, which we hear as sound. All objects have these notes? Yes, they have the notes. Some are more audible than others. So even the troll has its own note, a frequency at which it resonates. Scientists calculate that frequency by counting the number of vibrations per second. The glass vibrates nearly 500 times a second. And this frequency is its fatal flaw. So that ping yeah. is important because that's, that's a constant note. Yeah, it's a physical property of the actual object. How does that help us with breaking it? What we're going to do is we're going to turn the process by which we hear the note backwards. So instead of the structure vibrating we hear the note, we can actually put a vibration through the air and that will make the structure vibrate in sympathy. If you produce exactly the right note with the guitar that matches the note of the glass, then the glass will resonate. That means if you replay the exact same note that the glass produces, you can make it vibrate in sympathy without even touching it. It's called resonance. Eventually, the glass will vibrate so much that it will shatter. So it really is as simple as that. This has a note. It's a frequency which it likes to vibrate. So if we reverse the process, if we send the same vibrations back to it, yeah. it'll just vibrate in sympathy with yes. us yes. until it gets carried away and breaks. So we need to match this to that. Exactly. So they're both singing the same note. Exactly right. It sounds spookily simple, I don't believe it. To produce the lethal note for the glass, we tune the guitar to the exact same note the glass itself produced. Slow motion footage shows the glass wobbling like jello until it can take the resonance no longer. Now, as far as we know, that's never been done with a guitar before, but the principle is exactly the same as the cartoon soprano opera singer and the glass breaking. The point now is, what's the connection between that and trolley? Being shaken to bits by resonance could be a lethal threat even to a structure as big as the troll gas plant. Its 300 meter legs are like huge guitar strings. Certain sequences of waves could set them vibrating along their entire length. And just like a glass, if they resonate too much at a critical frequency, they could be shaken to bits. More than half a century after the collapse of the Tacoma Bridge, Trolls engineers took the problem very seriously. I heard it from the boss himself, Jan Huger. Talk to me then about this problem of resonance. Is it just you're sitting here waiting for a monster 200 foot wave? I mean, what is it? The problem was uh, not the largest waves. It was uh, if you have the waves in a certain height and a certain direction and a certain frequency, you could put some forces on the platform that it could easily break. It's like a swing. If you have the right period uh, and the right force and the right frequency, you can make it swing and vibrate. It isn't the biggest waves, then. It's, it's the timing, the interval, the frequency. Yes, that's right. How bad could it be? How big a problem is it? In the worst case, it could collapse uh, the whole construction. That would send the $16 billion trolley to the bottom of the sea. The engineers learned their lesson from the Tacoma Bridge. 
Troll's engineers had to stop the structure from resonating at the critical frequency generated by a sequence of waves. Back in the music studio, Jonathan shows me how to take the resonant frequency out of the danger zone. So this principle of changing the frequency is pretty easy to understand, because if you play a note on a guitar, that's a string, and then on the same string, if you put your finger on it, it changes the note. Yes, what you've done is you've changed the length of the string that's vibrating, and by doing that, you've changed what note it wants to resonate at, and instead of hearing a low tone, we hear a high tone. So you've changed the frequency? Yeah. And how can we apply that, then, to the glass? Well, we can do exactly the same thing with the glass. So if you just hit it, just tap it, yeah, that was the resonant note. If yeah. I just damp that and you do it again. It's changed it completely. Yeah. Can we see if it will actually stop it breaking? So if we set it up exactly as we did it before, if I play the note of the glass on the guitar. It's worth a go. It's worth a shot. The troll engineers use the exact same principle without the pencil. They retuned the platform by shortening the length of the legs that could vibrate. Their version of the pencil was a huge lump of concrete. Halfway up the legs, they fitted a special brace to stiffen the structure. It was just like holding down a guitar string further up the neck to get a higher note. Now, Troll's legs vibrate at a higher frequency. Waves can't hit the legs at a fast enough tempo to trigger the fatal resonance. And as for the Tacoma Bridge, 10 years after its unfortunate collapse, engineers built a replacement with a modified design using stiffening struts. Nicknamed Sturdy Gertie, in memory of its unfortunate predecessor, it's still standing. With the troll platform braced against wave resonance, the engineers moved on to their next challenge. Now they had to fix it to the seabed. And that's where the invention of the air pump some 350 years ago comes in. The troll gas platform is one of the tallest structures on the planet, rising over 450 meters. Engineers constructed it over 300 kilometers away from the gas field where it now stands. They built the legs and the main platform separately. To join them, they filled the 300 meter hollow legs with water, sinking them almost completely. This was the most perilous moment in Troll's life, with the legs now facing a water pressure of 380 tons per square meter. Another platform, the Slipe, had collapsed under the pressure at this same point just five years before. It triggered an earthquake measuring 3.0 on the Richter scale. But Troll's legs held fast. They floated the platform over the legs with just a metre to spare. Then engineers slowly pumped water out of the legs, raising them up to the platform centimetre by centimetre. A day later, the 656,000-ton structure was complete. Now the entire rig had to be raised to clear reefs that lay between the fjord and the gas field. It took 10 tons to ease the half-submerged troll through the narrow fjords. It became the largest object ever moved across the face of the Earth by humans but it still had to be fixed to the sea floor, over 300 meters below the waves. Ballasted with water, Troll weighs more than a million tons. But that still isn't enough to secure it to the seabed. This is where the invention of the air pump, some 350 years ago, comes in. In 1654, 
A German inventor showed off his new air pump with a demonstration of the incredible power of, well, nothing. Physicist Toby Ferenczi sets out to recreate the experiment for me. This is one of the most famous experiments in the world, isn't it? Absolutely. I'm not being rude. I just expected to see something a bit more obviously scientific. It's very simple. It's just two hemispheres made of solid steel. It looks like cookware. Yeah, basically. There's no mechanical bits inside, no, no flashing lights. No, no, no. It'd be great for a ratatouille. Inventor Otto von Guericke wanted to test the role of air in breathing and burning. So he set out to create a vacuum and invented the air pump. To show the Emperor of Germany how well his new pump worked, he started by sucking the air out of a sphere. And this is it, just three parts? Yeah, that's So every it. part is crucial. Right. And then I have to try and get the top piece on top of it. There we go. And then, crucial part of the experiment, a vacuum pump. All it does is suck air. So that's what makes our vacuum in there. Exactly. Okay. Turn it on, and now we're sucking. So this is what's fixing these two hemispheres together, that, pulling yep. the air out. Now in there, there's less air in there than there is out here. To replicate von Guericke's experiment, we need one other ingredient. Horses. Three, two, one, pull! But we haven't got any. We do have football players. And they're here to help me prove that nothing is stronger than a football team. But only if nothing is in the right place. Come on, guys, give it some heave. Oh. Von Guericke set two teams of horses to try to pull the hemispheres apart. And that's what these football players are going to attempt. Right, I think this should be about ready. OK, so that's cooked. Yeah. There really is nothing in there. We need some blokes, don't we? Right. Can I have the strong men, please? Over here. Time to be strong. Come on. Chaps. OK, let's have uh, two on that side, two on that side, first of all. I think we'll ramp this up slowly. So if you take the strain. OK, when we're ready. <clears throat> pull. <sighs> Give it everything you've got, boys. There's nothing in there. This is held together just by the vacuum that we created. Come yeah. on. Look at the faces on it. Come on, boys. Yeah, pull. One, two more. Let's get them up. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Go on, give it some heave! There's nothing in there! Right, let's have the last two on. We've got everybody on now. Come on. One, two, three. Oh, now they're getting serious. Come on, come on. You know what's in that sphere? Nothing. I mean, look at the size of this bloke here. That's a big lad, a big strong man, and you're being beaten by nothing. It's true, there is nothing inside the sphere. But because air is a gas, it flows all around the outside of the sphere, creating almost one kilo per square centimeter of pressure against the two halves and pushing them tightly together. That's like holding 70 kilograms of weight in the palm of your hand. The only thing that's holding those together is the pressure difference. You have no air inside the sphere, and you have lots of air outside, so the pressure difference is huge. So this is all dependent on pressure difference. It doesn't actually matter what yeah. the absolutes are at either end, but there's more pressure outside than there is inside. Exactly. Come on, lads, give it! Come on! Come on, come on! Von Guericke's 16 horses couldn't manage either. OK, guys, right, you can slacken off now. Your time is up. You have been beaten. Let's just get on the end of this thing and have a look, cos I just want to do something here, if you're ready. <laughs> it was easy. One tiny bloke did it when you lot failed, and that is the power of a vacuum. And that's how you keep the trolley gas platform pinned to the sea floor by using nothing at all. My research shows me the trolley designers used a 21st century version of von Guericke's hemispheres to secure the rig to the ocean floor. They did it by fixing a series of suction piles to the bottom of the troll's legs. Here is my model of the suction piles. Obviously, the real thing's quite a lot bigger than this, about 40 times the length. But this is how they work. Essentially, they're just like an elongated cup, open at this end, and then at the top, the sealed end, an essential piece of kit, there is a tap. And that's 
what makes it all possible. And here's how it works. Here's my recreation of the seabed. It's a sort of gloopy, gluey mess in texture. Pretty much what it's like. So if we put it in with the tap closed, so this is just like a cup, the big pile gets lowered and very, very quickly, it becomes very hard to push down at all because, well, what's happening, obviously, it's sealed and it's compressing the air in the top of the pile. And there's a lot of air in there to compress and it'll only go so far. And then when it's gone in, well, it's all wobbly. It's sitting on a bed of compressed air. However, if we open the tap on the top, suddenly the air can escape. It's not sealed. It just pushes neatly down into the seabed. If we close that tap, it's sealed again. So it's rock solid and steady. And in fact, it won't come out because what you're doing, you've created a pressure differential. And what I'm actually doing now is lifting the seabed out. Well, you can see some of the seabed coming out there. I can't move it at all. It's become part of the seabed. Open the tap. It can come straight out. That's exactly how it works, only bigger. Troll's 19 suction piles stand over 35 metres high and are fully driven into the seabed. Not even 30 metre waves and hurricane force winds can shift it. All that remains now is to get to the bottom of what Troll A was designed for. And the answer to that is right there. These are the pipes bringing the gas to the surface. So how do you get the gas out of the ground and back to Norway? That's where a racing car can help. When the trolley gas platform first drilled down beneath the North Sea 10 years ago, it tapped into a gas reserve which poured out under its own pressure. The gas surged up to the surface and through 70 kilometers of pipe back to the mainland. But after 10 years, gas pressure has fallen. This bottle represents the gas field and inside the fizzy drink is the gas. Now obviously when they drill into this for real, it's under enormous pressure. And there is a way of getting pressure in here straight away by using this inside the cap. These Ordinary sweets glued to the inside of the lid when I drill through will drop into this and they'll cause it to release all of the carbon dioxide from inside in one hit, putting it under immense pressure. Obviously, I'm not suggesting there are enormous sweets suspended underneath the surface of the sea. That's just to illustrate pressure. So we fix the cap on. Probably best if you don't try this at home, though clearly that's how we discovered it worked. I shall now commence drilling into my gas field. I've got a good idea what's going to happen. So have you probably, but this will illustrate it. Drilling. We hit the gas field, and out it comes. So for a while, everything's very easy. It does the work itself. The gas just comes flooding out. But after a while, inevitably, the pressure is all equalized. That's at the same pressure in there as out here. It's, it's not going to come out anymore, and it becomes a bit trickier. The only solution to that is you have to suck it out. Which is a fairly tasty alternative in this instance, but for real, it's complicated, time-consuming and expensive. Engineers needed a solution, and it came in the shape of an antique car. The 1902 Paris to Vienna car race helps troll engineers blast gas back to Norway. One driver, Marcel Renault, modifies his car and carries himself to victory. His secret, blasting more air into the engine. He invents the turbocharger. This is a much faster car than Marcel Renault's. But it's got a turbocharger that uses exactly the same principles he pioneered in 1902. This turbo makes the most gorgeous noise. What 
Marcel Renault Bigat has been taken to extremes, but it's still essentially the same box of tricks. As motoring expert Graham May explains. So, turbochargers. What are they about? It's a fan. It's a little compressor. An engine works on air and petrol, yeah. which ignites, makes it go bang. That's where it gets the power. But we add a compressor, and we can force more air in the engine, and it goes bang even more. And this is a real one, isn't it? That is the internals of that. So there's one in there, and that tiny little fan spinning away, that makes all the difference to an engine that's big and complex. This clever little fan can blast enough air into the engine to almost double the power of the car. And that's exactly the same principle Marcel Renault thought, yep. hello, if it uses air, yep. we'll get more in, we'll get more out. Correct. And it's all down to that. It's simple as that. <laughs> but how does Renault's souped-up engine help Troll get gas out of the ground? Important thing to know about fans. When they blow, they also suck. On one side, you feel a breeze, but on the other side is a pressure void sucking air in. Troll uses fans to suck the gas from the earth through these pipes. These are the giant's arteries, connected to its beating heart, its turbos. A fan is not a complicated thing. They all create a flow of gas or air. There's a fan here. And here it is working away. You can't see it because it's air, but you can see the work that it's doing because I can ask it to lift something, this ball. It can hold that up, no problem. But all fans, obviously, have a limit to how much work they can do. So if I tax this one by asking it to lift something heavier, well, we'll see what happens. It's just a bag of flour. No, you see, that bag of flour weighs half a kilo. The fans on Trolley can shift about 900 of those a second. And they need to be powerful. The fans have to blow the gas all the way from here, along these huge pipes, to Norway. And it only takes 84 seconds. That's almost 3,000 kilometers an hour. But that's all just numbers. How much power is that, really? Well, there's only one way to find out. This is a vertical wind tunnel. When the prop fires up, it shifts exactly the same amount of gas as the trolls fans. How far will it lift me? Big bloke, 65 kilos, 10 stone maybe. But now all of a sudden I'm a leaf. A small one. Oh, oh yeah. This is the same power leak as the fans on board the platform. Every second, Trolls fans move more than a ton of gas. It's amazing what a fan can do. And it stems from Marcel Renault and his turbocharged car. Nearly every part of Troll's amazing design has been created to help those giant fans do their job, pumping billions of cubic metres of gas on their way to 80 million users in mainland Europe, somewhere over the horizon there. 20 years ago, no one had built a platform on this scale before. Troll is a genuine marvel of modern engineering. Deep in its DNA are some startling connections. A plant pot made it flexible. A grain elevator made it waterproof. A pump fixed it to the sea floor. A musical note made it resistant to the lapping waves. And a turbocharger blasted the gas to Norway. It's simple, really, if you have the right connections. 